Okay, so today we're talking about David making a comeback, and we're not talking about our worship leader, okay? We're talking about King David uh, in, in Scripture, and we're going to be looking at Psalm chapter 51 today. Thank you, um, Elizabeth, for reading that for us today. How many of you know that most good comeback stories that we experience, um, they don't just feature an incredible feat by an individual or team, an underdog or an unlikely winner that just sort of like comes from behind and like does something surprising that we never expected to happen. Comeback stories also feature uh, a team or an individual or somebody who was expected to win, who had a lead really late, and they made a mistake. (laughs) They flopped, they screwed up, they uh, uh, blew the game, they committed errors. Something happened in order for the underdog to come and make that comeback. There was somebody that was being successful, there was somebody that was winning, there was somebody that was in the lead, and now they no longer had it. If any of you watch horse racing, the Kentucky Derby happened recently, and uh, If you followed it, it was one of the biggest upsets in Kentucky Derby history when Rich Strike, who had an 80 to 1 odds of winning, was able to come back and beat uh, the uh, favorite epicenter, who I believe had 4 to 1 or 5 to 1 um, odds to win. And you can see here's a picture of how far back uh, Rich Strike was. And there you have epicenter, the favorite, who was up in the lead as they're going around one of the turns. And Rich Strike was able to make this incredible come-from-behind victory, which nobody expected to happen. So I know a lot of the focus goes on to the horse that won, but we also need to realize that Epicenter lost. This past week, if you follow baseball, the New York Mets had an incredible comeback. And I, I'm just thankful that the Lord is bringing all of these incredible illustrations my way as I'm in the middle of this sermon series Uh, This past week, you can see on the scorecard here that the New York Mets were down uh, 7 to to 1. And in the final inning, they scored seven runs, which is one of the most incredible comebacks that you'll see in baseball. And I love this picture of the Phillies fan who just looks like he's about to cry. Because not only when we think about comeback victories – is there a victor and a winner, which would be the New York Mets in this occasion, there are the Phillies. And the Phillies are the ones who were having success the entire game. They're the ones who surprisingly lost. They're the ones who made mistakes, who let their guard down. Something happened, and there is the devastation of being the one on the wrong side of the comeback. So the question for us this morning is, how do you and I turn things around How do you and I make a comeback when we're the ones who've screwed up? We're the ones who've gotten things wrong. We've made a mess of things. We've given into sin. Things might have been going well and swimmingly for a period or for a time. And now we find ourselves mired in confusion. You see, sin is eagerly and always waiting to tempt us, especially when we're stressed out. When we're tired, when we're anxious, when we're hungry, when we're struggling, when we're hurting, when we're sleep deprived, when we're overworked, when we're in the midst of grieving loss, when we're walking through any sort of valley in life, sin is just waiting there, looking to help us cope in unhealthy ways. Do you know what I'm talking about? They might, sin might present itself through drugs, alcohol, food, porn, sex, shopping, violence, online streaming, and other addictive or pain-numbing practices. That's not to say that everything on this list is always, always sinful. It might just be the amount that we consume or the time that we give it or when we do it. But the thing is that sin is also crouching at the door when things are going really well for us. When things are looking up, when we're sort of on the mountaintop of life and we're experiencing great success, there's goodness going on. There's prosperity happening. There's blessing. Our dreams and our plans, they're coming to fruition in life. And we're experiencing wonderful favor. And it just feels like the right doors are opening for us. And it is in these moments that sin crouches at the door and is looking to tempt us with pride, arrogance, 
self-reliance, greed, gluttony, self-centeredness, sloth, and improper stewardship of everything that God has blessed us with. Have you heard the saying where it says, beware seasons of success and plenty? Because it is in these times that there are various temptations and vices that will pull at us, come our way, and lead to our downfall, to our failure, and then we're going to need to make a comeback. I like what Dean Johnson writes, and he says that much like the Israelites at the foot of Sinai, when left to my own devices, I have a tendency to build my own golden calf. There have been times in my life I have felt success, times when I have received accolades for achievements, times when I have felt I have done a good job, times when things are going just the way I had planned them to go. And it was those times when I found I had suddenly gone it alone. It was those times when I felt empowered by my own means, my own ways, my own will, that I now realize that I excluded God from my journey by relying on myself, by mindlessly not praying, and by casually missing church. Church is in parentheses there because he technically wrote mass as a Catholic, but I wanted to write something more appropriate for us. So today we're going to talk about learning to make a comeback from sin, and we're going to use Psalm chapter 51 as our template to do this. Did you know that out of 150 psalms that were written, there's only two of them that specifically deal primarily with the confession of sin? I was really surprised by that. I never had noticed that until I was looking through uh, and reading some uh, different commentaries and things. Psalm 38 and Psalm 51 are the only two psalms out of 150 that primarily deal with repentance and confession of sin. David wrote this psalm for Israel's use. All right. Now, it is a common mistake for us to think that David wrote this psalm as a personal repentance for his sin with Bathsheba. Look at the title of the psalm. It says, for the director of music, a psalm of David, when the prophet Nathan came to him after David had committed adultery with Bathsheba. And I think that we need to be a little bit more real here and say when he raped Bathsheba and had her husband killed and murdered. So the common mistake is that we're, David is using this psalm as like a personal journal entry, and then now all of a sudden we have access to it. That's not what's happening here. David is using his experience and him personally needing to make a comeback and to learn to repent um, in his life, and out of that is flowing a teaching moment by him so now all of Israel can learn to make a comeback just the way that he needed to make a comeback. It, there's a little bit of nuance here that we need to understand because in the psalm, we're going to see it language like this where it says, um, God, against you only have I sinned. I believe that's verse 4. Yeah, you'll see that in the, on the screen. We know that when David did what he did with Bathsheba and Uriah, he didn't just sin against God. But David is writing a template, a generic template for all of Israel for them to be able to make comebacks. So whatever it is that they're facing, and a lot of what Israel was dealing with was idolatry against God. So they needed something that they could use to confess their sin of idolatry and to be able to come back to God and say, I've worshipped other idols. I've you know, depended on other things that aren't you. I've put other things before you. Now I need to come back to you. Does this make sense to everyone? Okay, glad that you're with me. So now David has written something for all of Israel to use and now for all of us to use, for us to pray, for us to sing, uh, for the variety of reasons that you and I might need to repent. The story of Israel is the story of King David. The story of Israel is turning to God in seasons of trouble when things are hard and then abandoning God when things are good. And that is human nature and human tendency. We would think that it would be the other way around. We would think that when times are bad, we would get angry at God and be like, oh, God, I don't like you because my life is so hard. But we tend to go, God, I need you because things are difficult and things are really hard right now. On the flip side, in seasons of prosperity, you think we would be like, thank you, God, everything's coming from you, and I'm just going to stay super faithful to you now because of how you're blessing me. But it is in those times that we turn to sin. And then we need to make a comeback. When David became king, 
David experienced rest, victory, success, influence, and it is at this point of his journey through life that he has his encounter with Bathsheba and has Uriah killed. The question is, is where are you at this morning? How is sin manifesting in your life? What season of life are you in? Are you in a valley or are you on the mountaintop? Because you see, David had endured years of adversity. Before David was king, he was hunted by Saul. His life was a mess. It was struggle for him. He was on the run, living in caves. He was in hiding, fearing for his life. But yet in all of that, for the years that he endured it, he remained faithful to God. He remained righteous. He lived well. Even when presented and tempted with the opportunity to kill Saul twice, he chose not to do it. You would think that it was in that season of life that the pressures of the struggle would cause him to give in to temptation. But we find that after Saul dies, David becomes king. He's victorious. He's successful. The kingdom grows. The kingdom flourishes. He's on the mountaintop. And now, surprisingly, his downfall takes place. Let me just list for us what's going on in David's life leading up to 2 Samuel 11, which is the account, the chapter that uh, gives us the story of David and Bathsheba. So let's go back to 2 Samuel 7. It says in this chapter that God has given David rest from his enemies. And then we move on to 2 Samuel 8, and the whole chapter is about David being victorious over many enemies, and he's growing in wealth and fame. And just to give you a little bit of a sense of what's happening in his life, Let me read verses 13 to 15 of Samuel 8, and it says that David became famous after he returned from striking down 18,000 Edomites in the Valley of Salt. He put garrisons through Edom, and all the Edomites, Edomites became subject to David. The Lord gave David victory wherever he went. David reigned over all of Israel, doing what was just and right for all his people. We move into 2 Samuel 9, and this is the story of Mephibosheth, where David shows kindness and compassion to the, uh, the relative of Saul, his enemy. So we're seeing David in this incredible light, doing really great things. And then in 2 Samuel 10, the chapter is about David with his huge victory over the Ammonites and the Arameans. So in the last four chapters leading right up to 2 Samuel 11, we're being presented with a king who has success, triumph, Wealth, rest, everything. His, we're, we're seeing his godly leadership on display. And it is in this moment, it is in this season that David commits egregious and sinful acts. Where are you and I at this morning? If you and I are in a season of struggle, if you and I are in a season of pain, if you and I are in a season of grieving, grieving maybe you're under immense stress. You could be struggling financially right now. And that struggle is really real with the inflation going out of control right now, where what the dollars that you have in uh, your bank, uh, your paycheck just aren't going as far as you would want them to go. That is a real struggle and a real pressure that we're all finding ourselves under. Maybe you're struggling through a medical diagnosis. Maybe there's a strained relationship. Maybe uh, you're going under unfair attacks on your character or you've lost a loved one that you've really cared about. Maybe you're going through a really deep season of doubt, despair, and loneliness. In this season, how might sin be luring you and tempting you and drawing you away from God? Where are you giving in? Where have you given in? And where do you continue to give in? Maybe like David, you're in a season of goodness, plenty, and sunshine. Things are better than they've ever been in a while. You're experiencing your own victories. New doors are opening to you. Better opportunities are coming your way. You're seeing the dawn. The sun is coming up out of the night. And things are just uh, going in your favor. And you're being blessed beyond measure, beyond you've ever thought you could have in this life. And how is sin now manifesting itself to you, presenting itself? urging you, trapping you. In the season of goodness, where are you giving in, have given in, or continue to give in? 
basically what I'm laying out for us is that no matter what our light, lot in life is, no matter where we find ourselves, sin is at the door. We could be in the wilderness or we could be in the promised land, and it doesn't matter where we might be. Sin might grab its hold on us, and we might need to make a comeback to God. How do we do that? How do we come back? I've got good news. There's hope. And that's what David offers us by showing us what true biblical repentance looks like. And that's the key here. To make a comeback from our sin, it requires repentance. And there's no way around it. There's no other way to get through it. I've been praying a twofold prayer this week as I've been preparing this message. The first part of my prayer is that I really want God's spirit to just be super thick in the room. And I want him to grip us with his conviction, his kind conviction. Growing up, I've heard a lot of sermons about sin, and a lot of those sermons come at you with a lot of fear and anger and judgment. And that's not my intention this morning, so I'm really praying, and I have been praying this entire week, that the Holy Spirit would be so thick in this room, and that the conviction that we all feel if we need to feel it would be the kindness of God, the mercy of God, drawing us back to him, and it wouldn't be something that's coming from me in a really judgmental, fearful way for us, okay? That's been the first part of my prayer. And then the second part of my prayer is that for each of us to not miss the opportunity that is going to be presented this morning to put this concept into practice and to make our move of repentance. Because there are dire consequences that happen in our life when we do not give in to the conviction of the Holy Spirit. When we choose to ignore the Holy Spirit and when we choose to shut that voice down, the consequences is our hearts become more hardened to God. So there's real things that happen in us. We don't just stay stagnant when we don't take the opportunity that God presents before us. So I've been really prayerful that not only would the Holy Spirit be thick in the room, kindly drawing us to repentance, but that we would actively respond as people today. So let's just take a moment to pray before we jump into the points. Heavenly Father, we welcome you into this space. We invite you in to be here powerfully amongst us. Lord, I pray that what is said today from me would be presented well and that it wouldn't come across as judgmental. It wouldn't come across as uh, arrogant Lord, we're all here in the same boat as sinners. And I just pray that your mercy and your love would just tug at our hearts today. Because you desire to be close to us. And you desire your best for us. And Lord, give us the courage as people to respond. Lord, I pray that today would be a watershed moment for some of us. Where maybe sin has been attached to us in a specific way for a very long time. And I just pray for those chains to be broken. I pray for the power that sin might have over us. Lord, that it would be shown, you would be shown victorious today. Lord, if we have entertained sin in our life for a very long amount of time and we have become comfortable with it, Lord, I pray that today would be the day that we say no more. And I pray that as we walk through these steps, these simple steps today, Lord, that you would help us break free as we respond. Because there's stuff that you're calling us to do in order to repent. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. So what does David teach us in this um, psalm? I'm going to lead us through four steps of repentance that uh, we need to do to make a comeback in our life. We're going to start in Psalm 51, verses 1 and 2. So the first thing that David teaches you and I to do is he he tells us to ask God for a vigorous scrubbing. Okay? It says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, compassion, blot or wipe out my transgression, wash away my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. So right away, David leads into the psalm to say that repentance starts 
and is way more complicated, not complicated, but way more involved than just saying that we're sorry and expressing remorse for what we have done. It's great that we want to say sorry. It's great that we want to express regret and remorse. But David wants us to recognize that through our actions, we just haven't disappointed God. We've defiled ourselves before him. And that's a big, there's a big difference there between someone being disappointed versus us being defiled. John Goldingay, who's an uh, Old Testament scholar, says this. Dealing with sin requires more than merely acting in the space between the two parties, acting in the relationship. It requires something outward. The effect of sin is comparable to the effect of contact with death or using false objects of worship and or eating strange creatures. Such an act defiles a person, conveying an invisible stain, and a sacramental washing is the one element in removing such defilement. So the sin that we come in contact with, that we commit, the acts that we do, touch us in such a way as if it makes us like a, a diseased or a dead body to God. All right, so Kara this week found a dead lizard in the trunk of her car. We don't know where it came from, but there was this long lizard that was just laying dead in the trunk of the car. Where did this thing come from? I didn't even know lizards lived in this area. I watched Kara get rid of the lizard. She stood as far back from the trunk of the car as she could, and she, like, reached in with, like, like her fingernails, right? Not even, not even wanting the skin. And she grabbed the tip of the, liz- the, the tail, you know, like, like the thinnest part. Like almost, it was like the tail came out to where it was almost like a hair by the time that it ended. You know what I'm saying? So like she like grabbed it at that like hair tail part, picked it up and like flung it like out into like the side of the grass, like next to the car. Just her, I was already preparing my message for this week, and I'm watching this, and I'm like, that's like the sense of, defi- like, to come in contact with a dead body or something, def- like, there's a disgust there, right? And, like, there's something that we do to ourselves where our body, we are becoming defiled through our sin, which is, like, drawing God back from wanting to have contact with us. So there was this outward thing that Israel would need to do to get rid of the defilement, which is to make a sacrifice. So there was action that needed to be done in order to repent and to restore that right relationship with God. Praise the Lord, Jesus has come and died on the cross, and he has for once and for all sacrificed his life and made it possible for us not to have to go through all of those sacrificial rituals because his sacrifice is enough. And the Bible says in 1 John 1, 7, That if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. And that's a really key phrase here is that it purifies us. The defilement is gone. So God's sacrifice, Jesus' sacrifice on the cross gives us access to get rid of the defilement that sin brings into our life. As beautiful as that is, the tricky part is, is there almost feels like that means there's lack of movement that we need to make because Israel needed to go through the sacrificial rituals in order to get their cleansing from their sin. There was steps that they needed to take. But now that Jesus has died, we're like, well, I guess it's all taken care of. Everything's good. It's all under the blood. So I'm just going to keep going through life. I'm going to keep, you know, I've got my sin. Like, and we lose this sense of like, My sin defiles me, and I need to do something here in order to be reconciled back to God. Do you understand what I'm saying? So there's almost, it's not like the curse of the cross, but it's almost like there's like this permissibility culture that can grow out of the the death of Jesus to where we sort of lose this idea of like, what must I do now if I've committed sin against God? 
We do recognize that our wiping and our washing and our cleansing comes through Jesus Christ. He is the only one. He is the only thing that can erase the stain of defilement of sin in our life. No effort that we do on our own, no matter how much we try to be a good person, no matter how much we try to make amends or do something better and be like, I'm never going to do that again, and I'm going to earn my way back into right favor with God. The Bible says, no, there is this stain of death on us that must be dealt with through Jesus and the cross, and there's nothing else that can deal with it. So I use the term vigorous scrubbing here because the language, the Hebrew language that David uses here is the language of laundry. Doing laundry. Now, we, you know, we've got our front loader machines and, you know, things that we do now, but, like, imagine trying to do laundry. I'm guessing you're taking fabric and you're, like, beating it against rocks, maybe rubbing rocks together. Like, I, I mean, I don't know how you would do laundry, you know, to get something clean, but like, like think of like the old washboards, you know, where you're just like scrubbing the, you know, there's a vigorous, like, you're like, get the dirt out, right? Like there's something, sin so permeates us that the blood of Jesus has to do a vigorous scrubbing in us. And his blood is powerful enough to wash us white as snow. Isn't that amazing that Jesus is able to bring us fully back from our sin? So that's the first thing that David teaches us to do is to request a vigorous scrubbing. We must recognize our sin defiles us, and we need the sacrifice of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, to become alive, active, and powerful in our life in order to wash us from our sin. But that's not it. David next teaches us to admit our specific failures. Psalm 51, verses 3 through 4, he says, For I know my transgressions. And my sin is always before me. Against you, you alone have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. The question is, is are our sins clear to us? Are we able to see, do we actually know where we are living in disobedience against God? If and when our sin confronts us, and when it becomes made, we become made aware of it, David says, not only do we have to ask the Lord to cleanse us, but we need to admit specifically our sin. And it's a public confession. There's a public nature to this, because David's psalm would have been used in a corporate worship setting, a highly visible place. Leviticus 5, 5 through 6 says, When anyone becomes aware that they are guilty in any of these matters, they must confess in what they have sinned. As a penalty for the sin that they have committed, they must bring to the Lord a female lamb or goat from the flock as a sin offering, and the priest shall make atonement for them for their sin. So here in this passage, we see that we don't need to bring the animal because Jesus has become the sacrifice for us. That part is out of our hands. That's in Jesus's hands. But the part that is still in our hands is to make our public confession of sin. We have to. And then also, do you notice the language here at the very beginning of the passage? It says, when anyone becomes aware, which opens up the possibility that you and I can be sinning against God without an awareness that we're doing it. And then whenever it becomes aware to us, when we realize the error of our ways, has anyone ever been in that place where it's just like, oh my goodness, I've been living life a certain way and now it's just becoming clear to me that maybe that isn't like appropriate or good or godly and I need to adjust? Like when the awareness finally comes, we have to be able to admit it, confess it, speak it. So this is why... And I know this is more about the public nature of sin, the corporate nature of sin versus the individual, and I am focusing more on our individual um, sin. But what we saw in Buffalo, New York this week was a mass shooting, which was racially motivated, it seems, from what I'm hearing in the news, which is why it is really important in spaces like our churches, like we are in today, for us to publicly confess and repent from the sins of our country and from our, the collective sins that we, that we are all par a part of. Our people, we are a part of. Some people might say, well, it doesn't really matter. Why do you have to take time out of the service to say, say this? Why do you have to talk about Asian American Pacific Islander Month and like the bigotry and the stereotypes and the microaggressions? Why do you have to talk about this shooting? Because it matters. It's sin. 
okay? It's, it's the sin of us as people. These aren't just random acts. These are powers and principalities of, of the enemy, of the devil, that are manifesting themselves in us, through us. And we're collectively a part of that. So once we become aware that there's sin here, we got to name it, we got to confess it, and we need to repent from it. So we want to be very specific about these things. True repentance requires a deep awareness of our faults, a deep awareness of our failures, our missteps, and our waywardness. When I was a kid, I used to pray prayers like this. God, if I sinned at all today... Has anyone else prayed prayers like this? God, if I did anything today that just really disappointed you, just forgive me of it and help me to move on from it. It's not a bad prayer to make. It's like I'm covering my bases and I'm hedging my bets, right? Like I just want to make sure that God's good and that like every – I'm not saying that we shouldn't pray those types of prayers. But in that prayer, there is a lack of awareness for where did I sin. I'm saying, God, if I did sin, I just want your forgiveness, But part of a true repentance process, if we want to get past our sin and move on from our sin and see the Holy Spirit break the power of sin in our life, we need to have an awareness of it. It needs to come to, uh, we need to come to know it and feel it. So some reasons why we might be hazy around our sin or we might have a lack of clarity in our sin. The number one reason I believe that we have haziness or lack of clarity is our lack of understanding God's word. It is God's word that teaches us what God finds to be good, true, pure, right, and holy, and what he deems to be sin. So if we're not in the word of God, we're not going to know. It's not just going to be our conscience that tells us all the time when, where, how we are sinning. We have to know what the word of God says. The second way that we get hazy around our sin is our emotions, because sometimes our emotions are wrong. Our emotions aren't telling us what the right thing to do is, but we're saying, oh, this feels good. This feels right. Oh, yeah, I love this. This is great. But our emotions are leading us into sin against what God would say or have for us, but we're not clear about that because we're just imagining this feels right, so I'm good. Another area is our culture. When we grow in an area where, like, the majority of people find a certain thing to be permissible, good, and right, it's easy to get swept up into the group think of that and to feel like, that's good, that's right, I'm okay. And then all of a sudden, we're being deceived, and we're not clear on the fact that actually, no, this is sin because God says it is. It doesn't matter that everyone around me doesn't think it is. It is. Our families... When we are born into our family of origin, our kid, you know, my kids right now are already becoming immune to my sin. <laughs> and at some point, they're going to realize that, man, like my dad, you know, acted this way or was this way. And that's not really godly. And they're going to have to wrestle with that and come to the realization that just because this has been normalized for me my entire life in my family of origin, I have to break away from these patterns and break away from these habits and break away from this behavior that I've been discipled into because it's not godly. All of us are raised in broken families or by, you know, however we've been raised, wherever we've been raised, we've been trained up and discipled into sinful behaviors, thoughts, patterns that we have to figure out through God's word need to be changed. Is everyone with me so far on this? Okay. And then the last two here is our sinful nature. Sometimes we're listening to the wrong voice in our head. It's the, a concept of I've got the little demon on one shoulder and I've got the little angel on the other and which voice am I going to listen to and they're always talking. So if I'm listening to the wrong voice, that wrong voice could convince me of something that isn't good or godly to be okay and I'm now in my own mind convinced that I'm not sinful, I'm not doing something that goes against God because I'm listening to the wrong voice. And then the final thing that I'll mention is our hardened hearts. Because, and I mentioned it already at the beginning of the sermon, that when we 
when we develop a pattern in our life of desensitizing ourselves to the voice of God because he's trying to get a hold of us with his mercy and his kindness, and we are ignoring that and we're rejecting that, there are consequences to this. Our hearts become more callous. We lose out on our sensitivity. Our guilt might get diminished. The holy shame that God wants us to have to where we feel it and we know it deep in our hearts, now that's just been deadened and gone, and we're just sort of going through life in a more calloused nature. And now we're not understanding or aware of our sin because we've blocked out the voice of God. So I would say, Lord, would you just please break through the hardness of our hearts today? Would you break through all of the haze of all of the stuff that could potentially be bringing unclarity as to what sin is and where sin is active in our life? And may we have the clarity this morning to be able to name our sin to be very clear on what our sin is so that we can confess that. Not only are we going to ask God to wipe us clean this morning, we are going to specifically name our sin and confess how we have failed God. The third step that David walks us into is he says, we need to make an appeal for transformation. Verses 10 through 12 says, Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. So repentance isn't just requesting to be washed clean. Repentance isn't then just confessing and naming our sin. David teaches us that we have to petition God for transformation. Because that is what the, Holy, the work of the Holy Spirit in terms of dealing with us and coming in. So we're not just looking for forgiveness. We're looking to be made into new, creature, new creations uh, and for the Holy Spirit to do transformative, powerful work. So I'm saying, Lord, don't just purify me, but change me. Those are two different prayers. Don't just purify me, but change me. Think of it this way. So a mother has a little boy, dresses the little boy up for church, puts the little boy into his Sunday best, and says, okay, we're going to be leaving for church in a few minutes. Do not go outside and roll around in the mud. What does the boy do? The boy goes outside, and he rolls around in the mud, and he dirties up his Sunday best clothing, and he's just dripping with dirt, and you know, you know, and then he comes back in, and the mom's like, what did you do? I just told you, do not go out and roll into the mud. And the boy says, mom, I need to get clean. So the mom takes all the clothes off, puts on the second best pair of clothes that she has for him, and dresses him up in the next best clothes, and says, I've cleaned you up. I've washed you. You are purified. You are now back into the state that you were before uh, uh, you d- rolled around in the mud. So we are leaving for church in a few minutes. Please don't go roll around in the mud. What does the boy do? The boy goes outside, rolls around in the mud, comes back in filthy. All right? Now the mom's like, I got to clean you up again. I got to purify you. I got to what? I got to get these dirty clothes off of you. Well, I have asked you not to do this. Why? Like, and he's like, I, I just love to roll around in the mud. See, the thing is, is that God can continue to wash us. God can continue to purify us. But what needs to happen is he needs to transform us so that we don't want to roll around in the mud anymore. He needs to transform us so that his voice the things that he wants for our life become more important to us than the things that defile us. So it's, yeah, so it's not just, it's not just the fact that we need God to purify us. We need him to transform us from the inside out, from the way that we think, from the way that we feel, so that his spirit unites itself with our spirit in a way to where who God is, what God is, how God wants us to live now becomes the dominant priority in us, and we lessen the desire to roll around in the mud. In the end, what God is asking for you and me to do is to submit to crucifixion and resurrection. We have to crucify ourselves, crucify our flesh, crucify the parts of us that are not of God, and we must then allow the Lord to resurrect us in his spirit. 
And let me just say that it can get a little bit murky in this sense. But like, I just want to just be super honest right now to relieve us from like immense guilt and pressure to say we are always going to struggle with sin through life. All right? Until the day that Jesus sets all things new and we have a new creation, a new earth, sin is always going to be there. It's always going to be a problem. And I'm not asking us to like find ourselves in a place of perfection. What I'm asking for is our life should be on a trajectory of change where we see noticeable movement towards a more sanctified, holy life. We're making movement. We're, make, we're drawing closer to God. We're becoming more like God. You know, it's not that we're never going to sin. It's not that we're ever going to mess up. But the power that sin has over us begins to lessen more and more. And it becomes easier and easier to live for God. And all of a sudden, we find ourselves less entangled, less captive, you know, less bound. Uh, yes, we still are making mistakes. It's always going to be a struggle, right? We're always going to have to have this thing where we ask God for purification. And there's going to be times where the voice of sin is going to be more luring to us than the voice of God. And that it's just going to be a struggle throughout our life. But over the long haul, if we can look back one year from now and say, is my life doing better? Am I more free from sin now than I was five years ago? But if that can't, if I can't say that something, there's something problematic going on because I'm missing out on the transformation that God wants to do in my life. God is willing to clean us. God is willing to purify us. God is wanting to hear our prayers of confession. But that's not where God wants to stop. God wants to transform us, and God wants to grow us. And if we look at Galatians 5 and 6, we see this beautiful imagery of the fruits of the flesh being overcome by the fruits of the Spirit. So finally, the last step of repentance. We've talked about Asking for a vigorous scrubbing. We've talked about naming our specific sins in a public declarative way. And then we've talked about seeking for transformation. David finally says, repentance has now been completed when we begin to act differently. Psalm 51, 13. Then I will teach transgressors your ways so that sinners will turn back to you. So now instead of being the sinner, being the one that's doing the screwing up, I, my life will now, Lord, become part of this process of helping to teach others that they might turn to you. So the repentance becomes complete in us when our behavior and our lifestyle change. That is the actual definition of repentance, a change in behavior. That's where we're walking ourselves towards. And this is not something that you and I can accomplish in our own will and with our own strength. It is about God's power combining with our efforts and us working in tandem together to move past our sin. Change is possible. Who you and I are right now does not have to remain static for the rest of our life. God is able to do a powerful, mighty work in us. As David comes up and as we're getting ready to close, we talk a lot in the Christian life about adding more of Jesus to us. And it's a pretty popular message to be able to preach. And I, li I love to preach that message that we just need more of God, more of God. Let's get more of God in us. Let's let God's spirit fill us. God's spirit dwell in us. God's spirit take over us. But there is another component of discipleship and of walking with Jesus. And that is the removal of sin. It is holiness. It is sanctification. And it is living a life that is pleasing to the Lord. As I've preached for what's for me a difficult message to preach today, the call for response today is, have you been sitting here this morning and my prayer is that the Holy Spirit has been doing work? Not my words. I'm not trying to convince you. Uh, I'm asking, I'm wanting the Lord to use me and facilitate his spirit through me so that he is working in your heart and in your mind and in your soul and in your spirit, bringing to the forefront 
where we are sinning. Not in a condemning way, not in a mean way, not in a you're worthless way, but in a way that says, I want God saying, I want to be close to you. I want to purify you. Would you ask me for that purification? Are you willing to publicly admit and recognize and declare your sin today? You might be here this morning and you're saying, Jeremy, I've struggled with ingrained patterns of sin and addiction for a long time. And it's just this continual behavior that continues to cycle in me. I would offer you the four steps of repentance that David, and I don't know where you have been at or how you've been wrestling through and dealing with it. But may we follow David's lead this morning and begin to walk into the fullness of the repentance that God has for us. This biblical way that David lines out for us. Beyond just a wiping, beyond just a cleaning, beyond just a putting the new clothes onto us. But we would move from that. We would also move beyond just confession today. But we would move into petitioning for the transformation and inviting the Holy Spirit in. Inviting the power of the Holy Spirit in. To be baptized in the Holy Spirit. uh, In order to have the victory that God wants us to have over the sin. And then, not only to gain that victory, but then to turn And do that complete turn away from the sin and now live life differently and to just be saying, God, I am a vessel to be used for your glory and I want to do your will. I want to follow you. I'll take up the cross. I'll do whatever it takes. But my repentance is only complete when I have turned from that thing and now I'm heading in a different direction and there is good fruit, not bad fruit, not sinful fruit, but now there is godly fruit being produced from my life. So today, the call is just how David's song would have been sung in a public worship setting as Israel gathered together. We now hear, sing this song, gathered together as a people. And I invite you to respond to the Lord today. The altar is open. I encourage you, step forward publicly declare your sin in a way i'm not asking you to yell it before the entire congregation but by making that movement you are declaring to this congregation that i am a sinner i have sin in my life and i need to be forgiven i would ask come to the altar kneel down declare that to the lord allow our leaders to pray over you to encourage you ask god for transformation Seek him, intercede and say, Lord, I need you to change me. I don't just need you to wipe me. I need you to cleanse. I need you to to just overhaul me. That when I get up from this altar and when I walk out of this door, I 